Hello and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. In today's episode, we're going to get into the neuron, all things neuron. As you jump into the nervous system, you want a good solid foundation. You want to stay tuned. We're going to talk about all of this good stuff, how we classify neurons, the parts of a neuron, why there's such a big deal in the nervous system with convergence and divergence, and we're going to talk about myelin and a lot more. Before we get into it, you know the drill. I got to ask for your support. Please take a second and click those buttons below. It makes a big difference for me. And also, if you would like to support the Penguin Prof channel, you can download a free audiobook of your choice from Audible. The link is below. Here we go, we're gonna meet the neuron. We classify neurons anatomically and physiologically. So we're gonna do shape first. Now, the basic way that we classify neurons has to do with polarity. And you guys know about poles already, right? We're talking about the orientation of things. So the orientation of the cell processes. We classify neurons based on the relative length of those processes. And then sort of a strange catch-all category, we categorize neurons based on their shape and where we find them. And that's pretty much it. So let's take a look. First of all, there are neurons that we call anexonic, so without a definable outgoing process. They look sort of strange, and they are relatively rare. Next, we have bipolar neurons, and you can see why we call them bipolar. So you see two distinct processes that are emanating from the cell body. We have pseudo-unipolar, so you have one process that sticks out and then it splits. And then by far the most common type of neuron are multipolar neurons. So hopefully not too bad. So a good percentage of neurons you can classify anatomically this way. There are some other things that we look at. The length of what we call the axonal processes, the axon as we'll see, is the piece of the neuron that is emanating, sticking away from the cell body. Uh, and some other stuff. I just want to show you how many of these there are. Some of the names are kind of strange. Many of these are relatively rare, but depending upon your anatomy class, uh, you may have to know some of these under the microscope. Certainly, you'll have to know this one. Uh, it's pretty amazing looking. It's called a Purkinje cell. It's an eponym. And this is a type of neuron that releases GABA. And GABA is one of the most important inhibitory neurotransmitters in the central nervous system. So you'll probably see this guy. They're just amazing cells anatomically to look at. We also classify neurons physiologically, right, based on their function. And this has to do with the directionality of the message, not what the neuron itself actually looks like. So the idea is that we have neurons that come from the periphery. So they're collecting information. We call those receptors or sensors, and that information is carried through the peripheral nervous system. The neurons that carry this information we will call then sensory. You may see them also referred to as afferent. Note that that is afferent with an A. That information goes into the brain and spinal cord, the central nervous system, and then within the central nervous system there are neurons that live exclusively there within the brain and spinal cord, and those neurons we call interneurons, and they are the most complex of all neurons. Then we have neurons that carry information from the brain and spinal cord out into the periphery, and those we call motor or efferent. Notice that that is efferent with an E. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention. Afferent and efferent differ by only one letter, but they mean dramatically different things. So the motor neurons we classify as either somatic motor, which innervate skeletal muscle, or autonomic motor neurons, which innervate everything else, all the autonomic effectors. Those are things you don't have voluntary control over. I want to comment on this word innervation right now because students always ask me about it. It just means to supply with nerves. So when I say that somatic motor neurons innervate skeletal muscle, all it means is that those are neurons that talk to or send information to skeletal muscle. And as far as the functional classification of neurons, that's it. Pretty straightforward too. 
Let's look at general neuron anatomy. Now, the cool thing about neurons, they are very complex. They are unidirectional. So there is a part of the neuron that receives information and a part of the neuron that sends information. So, of course, we've got receivers, which gather the information. We have some sort of integrator, which is going to make the decision, quote unquote, about whether or not the neuron is going to fire. We have a signal conducting part, which carries the signal away from the cell body. And then we have transmitters, which carry the signal away from the cell altogether. So the parts we have here are dendrites. Dendrite means tree-like because that is usually what those processes look like. The dendrites carry information into sort of the heart of the cell, which is the cell body, and you will see that often referred to as the soma. Soma just means body, actually. And then we have an axon hillock somewhere in the cell body. We refer to that as the trigger zone. That has a really important role to play because it, in a sense, decides or it really assesses all the information that's coming in from the dendrites and makes the decision of whether or not this cell is going to send a signal to other cells in the form of an action potential. If the cell does fire and is going to send that signal, that happens down the axon. So the axon carries information away from the cell body, and finally you get get to the terminal of the axon. And that terminal contains chemicals, which we call neurocrines. Now, immediately students ask me, wait a minute, I've heard of neurotransmitters, but what the heck's a neurocrine? So we've discovered that neurons release a lot of molecules, not just neurotransmitters. So a neurocrine is a more general term. It does include neurotransmitters, but as you can see, it includes a lot of other stuff too. So this is a hierarchical term, if that makes sense. So you can say all neurotransmitters are neurocrines, but not all neurocrines are neurotransmitters. And if you just lost some neurons trying to figure that out, it's basically saying all chihuahuas are dogs, but not all dogs are chihuahuas, right? So it has to do with a hierarchy. Got it? Not too bad. All right, so basically when you look at the release of these chemicals, these neurocrines, the weird thing is neurons don't touch their targets. No touching. So between the neuron and the target cell, there is no structure, there is a space. This is a very important part of what the neurons are doing, sending signals across that space. That space is called a synapse. Sometimes it's called a synaptic cleft. And when you study the action potential and synaptic transmission, you'll get to see exactly how those molecules cross that space. Another thing we've got to mention right here, convergence and divergence. And the idea is this. On the dendrite end, you have what we call convergence. Many signals converge on the neuron on the input end, and they send their signals in trying to tell this neuron what to do, right? And it's at the axon hillock that that decision is made. But on the other end of the neuron, on the axon terminal, we have divergence. So the signal from this neuron diverges and innervates. It talks to many different target cells. And many neurons also have what we call collateral axons. So the axon actually branches, and that enhances this divergence. So it is important that you get here convergence, meaning signals coming together, divergence, meaning the signals spreading out. You are going to see this a lot in the nervous system. Next, we have the idea of nakedness. So this axon is naked. Sometimes we have axons that have no covering, and sometimes we have axons that are myelinated. That is, they are not naked. So these little gray coverings here represent myelin. Myelin is an insulator, and you will notice that this insulator stops and starts. It's not one continuous piece over the axon. And we actually refer to that area as a node, the nodes of Ranvier. You may see them also as myelin sheath gaps. So the first thing to notice that's really important is the insulation is not continuous. You see the axon poking through. When you think about insulation, hopefully you think about either thermo insulation or electrical insulation. So in the nervous system, myelin serves as insulation. It insulates the electrical change associated with action potentials. Now this video doesn't go through action potentials. I have another video covering that. But the idea here is that if you have myelin, if you have this insulation, check it out. Impulses can travel up to 100 meters a second. If you don't have that insulation, you're looking at 
at about one meter per second. Now, the way a neuron sends a signal is by making the inside of itself more positive with respect to the outside. If the axon is naked, it's going to have to do that by making lots and lots and lots of action potentials, and each one of those takes some time. The advantage of having insulation is that the neuron can send that inside positive electrical charge a lot faster because fewer action potentials are needed. So something that you can make as a connection, so a penguin prof connection, how you can remember this, um, myelin is not developed in babies, and that is why their movements are so jerky and uncoordinated, right? Because their myelin just isn't ready yet. Another way that you can remember the importance of myelin and what it does are in diseases where myelin is affected. The most famous of these is multiple sclerosis, where the myelin sheaths are actually destroyed by the patient's body. All right, where does myelin come from? Bizarrely enough, the neurons themselves don't make it. Neurons actually don't do a lot of things. They need a lot of support. Supporting cells for neurons are called glia or neuroglia. And there are two different types of glial cells that make myelin sheaths, depending upon where you are in the nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, the cells that make myelin are called Schwann cells. Schwann cells do their job by surrounding rounding and wrapping a particular section of a particular neuron. So their entire life is associated with one region of one neuron. And you notice this insulation, the myelin sheath is all cell membrane, right? What's a cell membrane? It's lipids, right? And lipids are great insulators, not only for temperature, but also for electricity. So these Schwann cells are monogamous. Okay, this is how you're going to remember them. Schwann cells are completely devoted to this particular region of a particular axon. In contrast, in the central nervous system, the cells that make myelin look completely different, and they're called oligodendrocytes, and they are polygamous. So they interact with multiple axons from multiple neurons. And in fact, a single oligodendrocyte can wrap myelin around as many as 50 different axons. Whoa, okay, that's a player. So how you're gonna remember this, monogamous Schwann cells in the PNS and polygamous oligodendrocytes in the CNS. And I've got a mnemonic for you. If you look at the first letter of these terms, you can say many single people prefer observing couples. All right, so that's a connection that you can make to help you to remember because student, I don't know why, students like Schwann cells and all of a sudden they just attribute all myelin to Schwann cells. Don't forget those oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. They do the same kind of job, but in a very different way. If you want more on the nervous system and a recommended order of watching these videos, I will put those in the down bar below. As always, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please show your support by clicking those buttons below. Like, share, and subscribe. Join me on Facebook. Follow on Twitter. Good luck.